Okay. All right, you are good to go. All right, uh, let's see, do we have all the aldermen present? Uh, Jason and Bruce, that's all I see. Heather's here, I need to see her. All right, uh, I only see two aldermen on the screen. Okay, there's Nathan. I don't see a photograph, I just see Alderman Nett. Okay, all right, let's check that. Okay, Flores, Alder. Yep. yep, we got him. Okay. Okay, looks like we're all there and Jeff is there. Okay, so, okay, good. All right, I call the meeting to order and uh, ask that you stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, under the justice for all. Just stands. I better open this back. Who's doing that? I thought it had a microphone in it. Somebody is not muted. I need a microphone in there. Is that Heather? I have no Okay, I just, I just, somebody's not muted. Okay. All right, I think we're ready to go. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of uh, June the 1st meeting? Oh, wait a minute. We need to do a roll call. For, I'm sorry. I called the meeting to order. Pledge of Let's do a roll call. A Chad Alderman She's right there. Heather, you need to unmute. I can't hear anything. Okay, yeah, we got you. Are you here? I'm at there's a mute button on mine. Yeah, I'm right here. There's a mute. Could you try to turn it on and off? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's okay. We, we can hear you. Go, go ahead and come on. I can't hear. Here. Can't hear. Here. 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 Okay. And if there's any consolation, this should be our last Zoom meeting. Should be. All right. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of June the 1st? Motion second by Schaefer, second by Alderman Poston. All in favor? All right. All right, uh, we have a scheduled visitor on a second reading bill, but since there's no discussion, we did, Jeff Myers did ask if he could have a few minutes to discuss. So I'm going to uh, turn this over to Jeff Meyer with IMF. I am, I'm sorry, IMS. Okay, Jeff, can we, you're muted. No, you be uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen with you real quick, if you'll allow me. Yes, sir. Uh, it's still not letting me pick up. I think you've got to give me a permission or something. Sam, does he have to have permission to share screen? Mm, let's see. Sam, it's in the security settings. I, I know yeah. how to do it. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I've got you. I appreciate the chance to talk tonight. Um, you gotta love these remote meetings, right? Um, no, don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna show you a very short presentation. I've been talking with Jeremy for, for a few months and just kind of show you a little bit about what we do. I won't take much time, uh, but just want to know we're not new to this game. Um, we've been doing this for about 35 years. Uh, we worked with over a thousand cities and counties in the U.S., primarily in Canada. Um, and we have a lot of clients that you're going to recognize, uh, people in the area, Springfield, Branson, Joplin, Jackson County, Nevada. Uh, so we have a lot of local experience as well. Um, and, and what we're seeing in Ozark is, is kind of fairly typical of a town this size. Uh, there's about 90 centerline miles of pavement. Um, we'd like for you to look at that as an investment. So I break that down a little bit. That's about 1.8 million square yards of pavement, and it comes in at a value of about 112 million. Um, haven't run the numbers for Ozark, but my guess would be that's the highest dollar value asset that the city owns. 
Um, that's enough to get to run about 313 Kansas City Chiefs football fields. Um, and an interesting note about uh, uh, Ozark, my daughter lives there, uh, Brandon and Hillary Roberts. So we had some questions over the last couple of meetings. Um, why would you why would you consider this? And, and I get that question a lot. But the reason why is it's called a 4015 rule. So when you put a new a new street in, uh, about the first 40 percent of that street's life, it only drops about 15 percent in quality. Uh, but over the next 15 percent, it drops about 40 percent in quality. And obviously, it's a lot more cost efficient uh, to to maintain a road at the top end of this curve than it is to maintain it at the bottom. I mean, the difference can be pretty staggering in some of these drops. So what we're trying to do with a project like this looks something like this. Uh, we're trying to catch it at a very cost-effective level of rehabilitation and keep it from falling into a higher level of rehabilitation. Um, and to give you an instant, an idea of the differences, um, typically our analysis is gonna target streets in we, what we call the upper low end ranges of rehabilitation. Uh, we like to catch the overlay territories and overlays will typically cost the city of Ozark about $20 a square yard. Um, if that pavement is not treated in the next two to three years, um, the rehab cost can jump up to $50 to $60 a square yard. So the difference in maintenance is staggering based upon the timing. So what our analysis is designed to do is go through and pick out not necessarily the worst roads in the city, but the roads that it will cost the city the most not to address in a given year, if that makes sense. Um, and our process is, is very proven. Uh, it's developed through a series of steps. Uh, we begin with the city's GIS and build maps. Uh, we then send vehicles in where, that are equipped with laser sensors to collect pavement condition data. Um, we then take that pavement condition data and we merge it with everything that's specific to Ozark, from rehab rates to budget numbers. Um, and we use that to formulate an analysis that delivers into a five-year rehab plan uh, with presentation materials um, that Public Works can present to council if the situation changes. Just a little bit about the technology. We run what's called LCMS2 uh, laser technology. There's a lot of numbers up there, uh, but, but what you need to know is it runs two ASTM D6433 standards, which are the nationwide standard, the most widely acclaimed nationwide standards. Um, they're state-of-the-art technology. We can pick up about 40 to 50 miles of data a day safely. And that's a, kind of a, a picture of what would be driving up and down your streets. We also mount that vehicle with high definition or, or high resolution cameras very high resolution, about 4,100 times 3,008. Um, and we have the ability to pick up visual verification of what we're mechanically delivering. So if there's any question about portions of the city or the network, we can always go back to that video footage and verify what we saw when we picked up the data. Uh, we can also use that data to develop other assets that the city may maintain. And when we talked a little bit with some of the departments in Ozark about that, um, what you're seeing is a color symbolized database of a lot of different right-of-way assets in this particular city. We can develop everything from sidewalks to curb and gutter to ADA compliance, uh, signs and supports, really anything that the city might want. Um, it's multi-view. Um, you can actually get to a, a visual or a picture of the asset and it's an easy way to maintain all of the uh, right away assets. Um, but that's job number one. There are two big picture deliverables to a project like this. Um, the first is to give you a point in time assessment of where you are today, condition wise. Uh, the next job is putting it in a format that's easy to consume, easy to convey to council, and easy to update and stay current on. So we try to deliver the data in a lot of different visual looks uh, that can be more easily consumed. This is a picture of the actual data at the segment level. And there are, are miles and miles of it. So probably our most difficult job is taking a lot, a lot of data that I'm making it easy to see and convey. Um, there's a map of the same thing. 
Um, as we get that condition data, you start to see representations that look kind of like this. This is from the city of Nevada. Uh, it's a smaller town. You guys are probably probably know where it is. Uh, but this is a, a pictorial representation of the condition of their network right now. And we look at a lot of different metrics that allow us to, to compare that data, whether it be the overall condition score, how many really good roads that don't really have an impact on the city's budget, how many really bad roads that have a huge impact on the city's budget, and then the overall shape of this curve, and what we can see coming over the next five to 10 years. Um, we then take that condition data and we start to customize it for an Ozark analysis. Uh, we get with Public Works and we start collecting, what kind of rehab and, uh, work do you do in Ozark? What does it cost you per square yard to do that type of work? Uh, what are the city's priorities? Um, what's the city's budget? How much can we bring to bear on a project over the next five years? So we start to customize that data and form it into an analysis. And we can weight that a lot of different ways. Um, we begin at 100% cost optimization. Uh, we've worked with cities and budgets long enough to know that that will never work. Every city has different priorities. Mm -hmm. And we see that being prioritized in anything uh, from downtown areas. Uh, we see different wards in the city that have different budget pools. Uh, we see cities that want to prioritize roads around their schools or hospitals. So we can accommodate any specific priorities that the city of Ozark would, would like for us to look at. And the end result, pictorially, looks something like this. Uh, this is basically a graph of an entire network. And you can see the different rehab treatments that are applied. It intersects with the strength data and we say, okay, your first priority for the city is probably going to be these shaded areas. And they almost will fall, almost always will fall into this thick overlay category because again, that's the last chance the city has uh, before it gets very, very expensive to rehab. But it's this is different for every city, depending on the condition of the network and the budget that's applied. And then we intersect that in a way that begins to, and to interest council very much. Uh, we start running financial scenarios. This is for the city of Fayetteville. Um, but what you're seeing here is the annual budget on the x-axis over five years, um, contrasted with what that budget level would do to the overall condition. This blue line is your trend line. And every intersection, uh, we can say if we want the city of Fayetteville to maintain its current backlog, it will require a budget annually over the next five years of about 4.7 million. Um, if we wanted them to stay right where they were, PCI or condition rating, it would take a budget of about 3 million annually. And we can run as many of these scenarios as you would like and present them in different visuals. We always run a top and a bottom end. So what would it cost to write a blank check and fix everything in Ozark up to a very high standard, the highest possible? And what would it cost to do, uh, what would be the state of the network if you didn't spend another dollar over the next five years? And then intersect as many different scenarios as, as you would like to see. And then we do the, the very same thing for backlog. Um, it's not rocket science. You can see the curve goes different, different direction, because the more you spend, the lower the backlog gets, or the very bad road. But we start to make it visually represent, representative for council. And then we, we put it into an interactive, interactive spreadsheet uh, that Jeremy and his team can update as changes are made. Um, we know that the best five-year plan in the world will never hunt for two years. Things will change. Your rehab rates will change. Your budget's liable to change. Your priorities may change. So we want Jeremy and his team to have the ability. You can see this is a fairly large spreadsheet populated with a ton of yellow hot cells. All of these hot cells are customizable on the city's end. And the example I always give, if, if a councilman called Jeremy one afternoon and said, hey, um, you know, with the current virus situation, we are not going to commit to increasing your budget annually. But what would happen if we dropped an additional X number of dollars into the network one time next year? These are the budget cells. Jeremy, while he was talking on the phone, would add, add that total to the year two budget click enter and the entire spreadsheet would recalibrate, including the visuals. 
And he could say, well, that would drop your, your PCI over the next five years from 72 or from 72 to 74. And if you'll hold for just a minute, I'll print this off in a, in a graph and email it to you on the spot. So we leave behind a very powerful tool to keep you current and updated and allow you to make data-driven decisions. And then our deliverables also include a full set of maps um, and a personal geo da database that links into the city's GIS system. So they can see visually the effects of the entire analysis. And at the end of the day, um, this is a very good representation of what we're looking at. Uh, if you look at two streets, you'll notice that this one has, I cannot see that because of my bar. This one has actually a higher PCI, um, but strength-wise, what's underneath the pavement is much, much higher. So this street can be deferred for quite a while because of the base structure. It's not really a critical rehab. Uh, this street has a weak base and a middle tier PCI. This is a street that will deteriorate very rapidly and it would be pushed up in the deferral process. And the reason why is that uh, from an investment standpoint, uh, there are a lot of times when unfortunately with budget constraints, an ugly street can stay ugly for a very long time, uh, but good streets don't stay good streets for very long. So we'd like to spend the money as efficiently as possible as opposed to applying it to the worst roads on the network. And that is a quick summary of, of kind of what we're proposing. Okay, any, um, any questions from the alderman or Jeremy, do you have any comments you would like to make at this point? Yeah, if, if you all can hear me, um, I think, you know, in the past presentations, we really didn't allow Jeff to, to get into what he presents across the country. I think this was a good uh, brief analysis of, of the tool that we're hoping to add to our toolbox to make, you know, really smart decisions moving forward. And it becomes highly recommended from our colleagues in Springfield. Um, and that's really how we got onto this, uh, this whole venture. But I, I, I appreciate Jeff taking the time. I appreciate the council allowing the time for him to, to do this PowerPoint. And if you have any specific questions, we'd be happy to answer. All right, the council have any questions of uh, Mr. Byers or, or Jeremy? Your Honor, I actually do, but I'm gonna wait till they're up on the agenda before I bring them up. Okay, this, uh, this will come up as a second reading bill. So uh, any questions? If, okay, then we will, uh, we will move on to new bills. All right, uh, let's see, Ted, Bill 3162. Your Honor, I bring the first bill 3162 on this Your second? Mr. Postman, second? Motion I don't know what he said, Your Honor. Do what? I don't know what this, I, I can't hear Mr. Smith. I'm not sure. Yeah, he was hard, he hard to hear. hear. All right. I concur. I move that we place Bill 3162 on its first reading by title only. All right, seconded by Alderman Poston. All right, Ms. Cattle, are all in favor? Okay, all in favor? Mr. Doris, raise your hand. Are you in favor of reading it? Okay, good. All right. Thank you. I'm just going to say that Ted's voice is not clear. Okay. Well, he is the furthest one away from the microphone. Did you understand what uh, he made a motion for us to put Bill 3162 on his first read? Did you hear that much? No, I didn't, but I'll take your word for it and I'll vote for it. Ms. Galloway. An ordinance declaring the results of an annual election held on June 2nd, 2020 in the city of Ozark, Missouri. Okay, uh, looks like we will have a swearing in if there is a, uh, a motion to expedite this bill. We need to do this tonight. So do I hear uh, Mr. Smith? 
Absolutely. A move that we please bill 3162 on its second reading by title only, please. Motion made by Smith, seconded by Flores. Uh, all in favor? Ms. Callaway. An ordinance declaring the results of an annual election held on June 2nd, 2020 in the city of Ozark, Missouri. Your Honor, I move that we adopt Bill 3162 as Ordinance 20-041. Is there a second? Motion made by Smith, seconded by Forrest, to adopt Bill 3162 as Ordinance 20041. Roll call vote, please. Aye. 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 Okay, now we will uh, proceed with uh, the first ever virtual swearing in. So, uh, Chandra will move up where you can hear her well, and we will do this one at a time. Okay, all right, you can. Uh, just take directions from Chandra. All right, we will be swearing in uh, Alderman Coaston, Alderman Galloway, and Alderman Alder. That you guys will, uh, you can stand, raise your right hand. Thank you. Uh, do you say your name? Chris Galloway. Heather Alder. Name is Nathan Unmute. He's muted. Nathan, can you unmute and say your name? Okay, here we go. Can you unmute, Nathan? Yeah, I do. That in my duty as an alderman of the city of Ozark, that I would support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Missouri, the ordinances of the city of Ozark, and the laws of the state of guaranteeing the cities in the fourth class. That I am not indebted to the city of Ozark in any manner, and that I will faithfully demean myself in my office and discharge my duties according to the ordinances of the city of Ozark beginning the 15th day of June 2020. So help me God. I do, so help me God. Thank you. Heather? I do. All right. I do. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much for your, for your patience. This is a uh, uh, something we've never done before, and I hope you don't have to do it again. All right, uh, not part of the bill, but just part of an explanation. You know, this is the time of year when we reassign council liaisons, and uh, so they are on your agenda. They are below that. Uh, there were two. I, I left the same. I, I think the uh, the budgetary process with, with CAD and uh, with everything that's going on in planning and development, uh, I wanted to leave Nathan and Ted in the same positions they were in. Uh, but I wanted to kind of, as we do it just about every year, stir the other things up a bit just to give everybody experience in different uh, areas of the city. So that is the explanation, but you're used to hearing that because we do it about every year. So thank you for that. All right, we'll go on to uh, Bill 3163, Mr. Schaefer. I would ask that bill number 3163 be read by title and short description only. Second. Mr. Seconded by Mr. Flores. So motion made by Schaefer, seconded by Flores. Uh, with Bill 3163 of his first reading. All in favor? All right, Ms. Galloway. An ordinance of the city of Ozark, Missouri, authorizing the city to enter into a contract with the Ozark Chamber of Commerce for professional services. Okay, Mr. Childers. Well, as you know, we uh, have a current contract is called what we refer to as the COVID contract. It was a three month contract and that contract extends to July the 6th. 
So, of course, we began to work on what that contract might look like uh, as our existing one expires and we move into the rest of the year. Um, you may recall that there was a committee that was established prior to the COVID situation that began and uh, it was really put on hold and replaced with the one that we currently have. So all we've done is, uh, well, I shouldn't say all we've done. So Miss Evans and I have gone back and we have sat down and we have worked on uh, what the proposal for the remainder of the year would look like um, and what might be proposed for even next year. Uh, one of the things that you'll probably see is a change and I, I want Miss Evans to be able to explain this as well. Um, Typically, we have a three-year commitment. Well, there's a lot of unknowns out there right now, and so not knowing what any of our situations are going to be, um, what is being proposed tonight or for a first reading is uh, to complete the remainder of 2020 with the contract that's in your packet, and then the additional year would be only for budget year 2021 rather than multiple years like we've done in the past. Um, we think that the economy is certainly changing. We don't know from day to day, week to week, month to month, what that's going to be or look like. So we just want to make sure that we have those conversations. We have something before you that makes sense. We've changed some of the deliverables in Exhibit A, which certainly Miss Evans can uh, point out. I think she plans on telling you what some of those are. So that's where we're at. So it's been great working with Ann, sitting back down, figuring out what our next step is. Um, we've certainly consulted also with uh, uh, Show Me Christian County because you'll see that, that we all three work together. Um, it, it is uh, us helping each other, regardless of whose contract it is, because it's all economic development. So with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Evans, if that's okay with the mayor, and let Anna explain a little bit more specifically what uh, what's in the contract proposed. Go ahead, Anna. All right, well, Mr. Childers, thank you very much. Um, if it's all right with everyone, I would like to share my screen with you, so I will do that. Make sure I can get over here. Okay, um, so what I want to do very quickly, um, I've kind of gone and lined out a few of the changes that you uh, might notice even from the initial three-year contract that was proposed earlier this year. Um, before I do that, just really quickly, um, number one, wanted to say again, thank you to the Board of Aldermen for, um, for your flexibility and for being very proactive and forthcoming um, in, in helping basically helping us um, as the chamber make sure that we're addressing the priorities that the community needs addressed at this time. Um, I know that the landscape looks much different now than it looked even six months ago. And uh, again, like Steve said, that's part of the reason why um, this proposed contract that's, that's in your packet tonight is uh, basically 18 months instead of three years like it has been traditionally. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and hop into some of that. But again, just wanted to um, say thank you to the Board of Aldermen and to the city. Always uh, really heartening to work with the city staff that we have on hand. We enjoy a fantastic partnership with our city and with our municipality. Um, it's unfortunate, but there are definitely uh, some locations where that is not the case, where the, the local Chamber of Commerce um, does not work well with their city. The city doesn't work well with um, the chamber and the business community, so I'm happy to, to continue being a part of um, making Ozark the exception to that. So the overall contract, um, whenever we take a look at why it's important for us to be in partnership, um, I just kind of want to keep in your mind that, and present it as when we're looking at economic development services here on the local level, the way that we as staff approach it is it's really an investment into an infrastructure that's in place, um, a staff that's in place in the Chamber of Commerce that can really respond with a lot of flexibility to what the city's priorities are and what the community's and business needs are. So, um, you know, as we encounter these situations, for example, like COVID, uh, which who could have ever seen coming, but whenever we encounter situations like that or, you know, the the if potential priorities need to change with the Journey 2030 plan, different things like that, we're able to, um, like I said, really respond with some flexibility and, uh, and 
be sure that we're delivering a high quality product and that we're doing our very best to advocate for our local businesses and make sure that our economy is as healthy as possible. So as Steve mentioned, a couple things um, just to draw your attention to, you will see a few references here uh, within this contract and I'm, I'm assuming and hoping that everyone's had the chance to, to read through it. Um, but you will see some references to the Christian County Business Development Corporation, of course, show me Christian County. Um, and the reason for that is because the contract um, that we had in place prior to this year was passed in 2017. So we had a contract, a three-year contract in place from 2017 through 2019. When that contract was originally agreed upon, um, the, the Show Me Christian County organization did not exist. And so language has been included in this version of the contract to kind of outline the fact that uh, the chamber is working with the, our municipality on a very hyper-local level to implement um, what is ultimately kind of a larger uh, countywide economic development effort in some instances. So that's why you'll see some references throughout the contract to Show Me Christian County. Um, they've been fantastic partners to us. And I think that, as Steve mentioned, all three of our organizations work really well together. So business development and attraction. Um, we'll, I know we have the opportunity to speak a little bit further with you um, at the upcoming breakfast meeting. But uh, long story short, you know, business development and attraction is always going to be a part of what we do. We're never going to not be a resource for a business who is looking to move into our community. Um, we're happy to respond to that, coordinate uh, any efforts that need to go into um, any of that recruitment process. But more than likely, as we look at finishing out 2020 and through 2021, that's not really going to be um, our focus or our priority, just you know, I, it's just conjecture at this point, but I'm going to guess that with the economy the way that it is, we're not going to have um, the instances of potential uh, business development, maybe from the ground up that potentially we would have had pre-COVID. So more emphasis has been placed on that business retention and expansion piece. Um, as we all know, uh, you know that there's a huge, huge percentage. It's, it, you know, people say as much as 80% of jobs that are created and generated in a community um, come from those businesses that are already here. So it's really uh, important for us to prioritize those businesses that we have. They're our community partners, they've invested into our community, um, and we want to make sure that we're doing what we can to work with our existing businesses to build that strong economic base. So um, a couple of the things, anything that you see, I've gone ahead and highlighted in yellow um, a few of the things that we've added um, that were not even in the previous version of the contract that was originally going to be proposed. So um, we are proposing, uh, I, I won't go and, and read it word for word, but um, working with city staff and local service providers for kind of a community assessment. So we want to be able to understand when we look at our city and, and we look at development, what are our assets and what do we need to work on? You know, what technology do we have in place if an XYZ company wants to be able to expand their services. Um, this is something that came about, as, as Mr. Childers mentioned, through conversation with him and with city staff about making sure that we have the capability to look at what we need and where we're able to grow. Um, a big part of, additionally, that business retention and expansion is going to be increasing the voice that our local municipality has whenever we're speaking with our elected officials and um, whenever opportunities for legislative advocacy come up. So uh, we're working, again, on a very hyper-local level about specifically what are Ozark's priorities? Are there things that we need to be a louder voice on um, in Jefferson City, you know, with our state representation, with our federal representation? We're also working um, very well with other chambers of commerce and with other uh, local economic development partners in our county to see if there's um, what our priorities need to be for kind of that countywide legislative voice as well. And you'll probably hear more about that on Thursday. Um, we did, you can see per the agreement between Ozark, Show Me Christian County, and SREP, um, what that means is basically Ozark is still going to be its own individual municipal community partner with SREP, which is the Springfield Regional Economic Partnership. Um, however, now that uh, Show Me Christian County, the Business Development Corporation, is in place, there's, um, there's also going to be a level of regional representation that we gain from that. So we're excited about that. Um, but that is, I, I have that uh, 
those details if anyone would like them. Um, again, with some, some legislative advocacy, representing Ozark in an annual readiness assessment that is conducted by USREP. This is part of a, that new agreement that we talked about um, that, that we have helped partner with to create. Um, so again, uh, some of that legislative advocacy, um, we want to be sure as well, and whenever we're talking about the community partnership, that we're providing the opportunity for the city to provide as much education to the public and to our business public as possible as to um, just raising the level of understanding of what the city actually does. You know, there's we've had many conversations, especially over the past few months, about how do we up the level of public awareness um, and especially the level of awareness of some of the you know, major decision makers in our community as to how does that legislative process actually look? How does our local city staff make the decisions they make and, and you know, follow up on the different projects and job duties that they take on? So we wanna provide the opportunity for um, some education on that. Um, we also want to utilize our past graduates of the Ozark Leads program. So this is something that we, we've had kind of some informal communication, some anecdotal um, you know, conversations with past Ozark Leeds participants and graduates, but what we have seen, this, this will be the fourth class of Ozark Leeds to graduate. Their graduation ceremony is June 26th, by the way, so put that on your calendar, but the fourth class of Ozark Leeds um, with about 15 to 18 participants in each class. So we're starting to get a pretty good group of folks who have gone through that program and had the opportunity to kind of take that deep dive and become very educated, and hopefully become community advocates for, um, again, just like what we talked about, how does our city determine its priorities? How does Ozark function um, in all of these different areas, whether it's public safety or education or local government or economic development, things like that. So we want to create a more formalized process to be able to utilize those past graduates of Ozark Leads um, to be a, a good source of community feedback whenever we're determining you know, what some resident priorities are and different things like that. We, we want to engage those um, informed and, and educated citizens who have been able to go through that program. Um, so those are the few of the highlights of things that have been added since the last time um, that you saw this. Anything that you see here on my screen that is highlighted in orange indicates something um, that the chamber has already, um, maybe even already begun working on for this year. So just I'll pick one out, represent Ozark in the Missouri Economic Development Council. So we have already as a chamber um, re-upped the city of Ozark's uh, representation in MEDC for this year. So anything that's orange there is actually, um, just for your information as to why it's highlighted, actually something that we've either, uh, that we have started the process on already. So just to throw that out there for you. Um, and then of course, uh, Ozark Leeds is always gonna be important. We are celebrating and looking forward to continuing our relationship um, just for this year uh, is all that we have on the books, but our relationship with 417 Magazine and the community guide that they're producing. Um, we've, we've started the process to continue producing that community guide for this year, and we will expect a fall publication of, of um, that guide, so that will be exciting. And then for 2021, um, like Steve mentioned, it's uh, whenever we're in conversation, we're just looking at, you know, how quickly things can change. Um, we've all seen over the past three or four months how quickly things can change, and so just in order for us, for both the chamber and the city to be able, again, to retain that flexibility and adjust whatever priorities we feel need to be adjusted, um, what we're proposing is only a contract through the end of 2021 and not extending all the way through 2022. So I will um, stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to you, Mayor Gardner. Okay, uh, any questions of uh, Ms. Evans from the Board of Aldermen? <clears throat> Mr. Postman? Oh, I was unmuted. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so I've got a question slash concern. Um, I see that the State of the Community Dinner and the Christmas Parade are on here for both years. Uh, should we be budgeting for those, given that we don't know exactly what status we'll be in with COVID when those times roll around? That's kind of one question, and I'll, I'm going to ask them both, and then I'll let whomever wants to respond, respond. 
So yes, those two, those are both would be large groups. Should we be planning for those two things? My second one is that's 5,500 bucks each year um, at a time when, you know, the, the city just got a, a, a pretty big no from the voters. Um, if money's going to get tight, I don't know if a Christmas parade is the proper expenditure. And I think I would say the same thing about the state of the community dinner. I know that it is a popular event. It's also an event that's morphed a lot over the last few years. Um, several years ago, you know, the, the city, county, uh, school, I can't remember who else was, you know, showed up and, and gave presentations. And now it's really just a dinner where we bring somebody else in as a, as a keynote speaker. So I, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. I, I feel a little uneasy. The rest of this contract, I think is fine with me. Uh, but those two items, given COVID and uh, our economic uncertainty, um, concern me. You, want to respond to that or other? you mentioned budgeting. I, I, uh, I don't know if you really mean should we be budgeting for those or should we be adding them to the contract? I would say that if you have the intention of even considering and can afford within your budget to put those types of community outreach um, items in uh, in the budget, then you would do that in the form of a line item. Um, you know, you, you this is the contract. So I think the real question is, do you want to consider adding those as support to the chamber for those events in the contract? Not so much should we be budgeting them? Not at this point anyway. Um, I just want, I want to, I don't know what the budget's going to do. None of us do. But um, I just want to make that point that it really is about the contract, not so much about how we're going to budget um, next year. I, I understand your point. I, and I get that. That's not what I meant. I, I mean, you, you know what I meant by it. Whether it's, it yeah, comes out of our budget or we pay it through a third party, we're budgeting for these items. Right, right. Alder, if, if you don't mind, Mayor Gardner, can I address that question? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, so just... I, that's a valid point, um, and I wanted to assure you, you know, we've, of course, as the chamber the past few months have really disrupted, um, especially our, the, the events that so many people um, look forward to, and so specifically for the rest of 2020, every single event we plan has a, can we hold it in person the way that it has always traditionally been held plan, and then kind of an alternate if COVID persists and public health conditions are bad at this level, here's what we do. You know, at this level, here's what we do. So I think it's it just it's like what you said. It's it's a valid question to raise, and it's kind of um, I I await to hear what the priority is decided to be um, from the city. But I, I agree with Steve. I do think that. Um, there is definitely a value in whether a chamber of commerce or whatever entity you have. Um, I do think that there's definitely a value in being able to to have some of those community events. I mean, you know, last year Governor Parson was our speaker for state of the community, so that was, um, you know, just an example of of something that I think a lot of people were able to look forward to and kind of put Ozark on the map a little bit. And I appreciate that. And I should have prefaced everything I was about to, or that everything I did say rather by saying is I, I've got nothing but respect for the chamber and the work that you do. This is simply about, I mean, at the end of the day, this is a numbers game at this point. Um, right. The numbers got to work for us. So I wanted to say that. Sure. There, there is one point I will make too. And remember in the contract, this is subject to um, each year's annual budget. So even though this is being proposed in a contract, it is subject to a bro, uh, to budget appropriations. So Alderman Post and say we are setting the budget for 2021. Um, you will have the opportunity at that time, whether the budget for that or not budget for that. Um, now, Ms. Calloway, if I'm stating that wrong, please help me um, state it correctly. But anything we do is subject, uh, any multiple agreement we might enter into is subject to annual budget appropriations. So you still would be able to make that decision. All right. Any, any more comments? 
This is a first reading bill, so I need to ask, is there anybody in the audience that would like to comment on this? If there is, Samantha, why? Chime in. Okay, apparently not. Anyone, uh, anyone on Zoom that needs to comment? Ms. Seitz, did you raise your hand? No, sir. I'm looking forward to presenting this more in detail at the breakfast meeting on Thursday. But uh, of course, I'm available to answer any questions that any of the aldermen may have as well. Well, I thought I saw you raise your hand. That's why I asked. I wasn't expecting you to necessarily. <laughs> you were just waiting. Okay. All right. Uh, any, any more comments from council? Okay, then if not, uh, nothing from the audience, and we will uh, hold this over to the next session. All right, uh, Bill 3164, Mr. Galloway. Your Honor, I move that we place Bill number 3164 on its first reading by title only. Second. Motion made by Galloway, seconded by Poston to put Bill 3164 on its first reading. All in favor? Okay, Ms. Galloway. In ordinance of the city of Ozark, Missouri, accepting the bid of SAK Construction LLC and authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with such bidder for construction services for the downtown sanitary sewer rehabilitation project. Okay, uh, Mr. Parsons, any, any comments that you would like to make? Mr. Childress has left the room, but I'm sure you would like to explain that. Yeah, I'd love to jump in and just explain a little bit more about this. Um, over the last three years, we've been budgeting at minimum $300,000 per year to help um, alleviate some of the inflow and infiltration that we're having into our sewer system. So basically the storm water or groundwater that's getting into our sewer system. Um, we carved out a piece of the downtown that is in connection or kind of in line with the same projects that you approved over the last two meetings, uh, the downtown central business district. Um, we've carved out approximately 4,700 linear feet of pipe that we can repair trenchless. And that's the key here. This is, this is pipe that's actually using the uh, cured in place pipe, not disturbing the ground um, not causing negative, overly negative impacts on the streets where the sewer is located in our downtown. Um, so it's certainly reduced the amount of adverse impacts. The cost savings is significant. Uh, we got really competitive bids. To break it down for you, we were very fortunate that the sewer lines, the majority of which in the downtown, were in good enough shape to utilize this CIPP technology. Um, so we're able to get those pipes uh, fixed. We're able to alleviate some of the I&I &I, and the cost savings is significant. And it's even more so in an urban setting. This contract specifically is for the central business district. When you start cutting into streets and replacing pipe, the cost and the headaches go up significantly. So we did our first CIPP projects over the last two years. This will be uh, another project where we can utilize that. Um, and if you have any questions specifically, we're just excited. We got good bids back. It, uh, it helps set the stage again for the paving next year, whatever that may look like. But we will have all the infrastructure repaired um, where we'll be um, basically just, you know, tearing up the streets or downtown pavement next year, so. Any, uh, yes, Mr. Galloway. Uh, yeah, Jeremy, I remember uh, when I first uh, built or rehabbed a building in downtown Ozark, uh, one of the things that I had to contend with was a uh, burst sewer line <clears throat> outside my building. Um, and uh, I remember my shock uh, when I was told uh, that my sewer line was made out of clay. Um, how much of uh, 
uh, downtown's area, do you think by percentage is still clay piping? Well over 90%. Um, and that's for the mains. There are a lot of lateral lines that, have, that use PVC, but the mains, and fortunately, Mr. Galloway, th those clay tile mains, um, we've been cleaning them, we've been keeping up with maintenance, and they're in good enough condition to go in and basically put this pipe inside of them. Um, so imagine putting a stent uh, in an artery of a heart. This is essentially that's the vision I can give you. That's what this does to the existing main. Um, so we're very fortunate, even though we do have clay tile pipe, uh, this is exactly the type of technology that was created for the VTC pipe, or BCP, I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I'm glad of that, and it sounds to me like that's a very cost-effective and, well, and an effective way of of uh, addressing it, but I think that there are uh, members of the public listening in, they would be surprised that 90% of downtown sewer lines are made out of clay. Um, uh, I really think this uh, bill is long in coming and I urge uh, my fellow members to vote for it. Any other questions or comments, Mr. Parsons? Go ahead. I said now that we pretty much summarized it again, this is just setting the stage for uh, the big downtown projects that we'll be doing this summer as well as next year. Um, I think Mr. Galloway hit it on the head. This has been a long time coming. This took years and years um, of planning, working with the boards of aldermen and uh, working with our engineers, and it's finally coming to fruition. Oh. Yeah, well, Jeremy, I, I've got a question that something that I guess I have uh, not totally understood this downtown project that's coming up. I thought that, that we were going to be replacing a lot of the sewer and water lines and paving. So what I'm hearing yeah. that we're going to be not replacing the sewer lines, but be but basically be repairing them. Yes, that is correct. We are very fortunate uh, to have sewer lines that are still um, in good enough condition to actually use this technology. Uh, we're, I'm just like you, Mayor, we thought that the majority of our pipes downtown would have to be replaced. We identified the pipes that had to be replaced, and that was in our last bid packet for the downtown infrastructure for water and sewer. Um, so we are going to replace a small portion, but the majority of these downtown are in good enough shape. So we were pleasantly surprised because you're talking about a, a cost decrease of nearly 66%. Um, we can do a foot of pipe for around $23 in this contract, whereas um, you know, a new sewer main in an urban setting can be well north of $70 a foot. So. Hey, well, that's good. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad to know that, and, and uh, that's one time I'm uh, glad I was misinformed, so or misunderstood, didn't understand. So that's good news. Any other questions or comments? Now, is that something uh, we need to move on or act on tonight? I was going to um, ask you a question. Got... Wait, Mr. Yeah, Flores. Right. Yeah, just hey, I was just curious, and I didn't see it in here, but uh, do they have? Do they give a? Um, a time on how long these will last is it is it uh i'm assuming it's going to be some kind of pvc conduit they're putting through there so i'm going to say it probably has a pretty long lifespan but do they give any any kind of uh timeline on how many years this will this will be good yeah the materials that they're using it's um you know on average they say 50 years i've heard up to 70 but this isn't just a short-term fix this is a you know, a poly line that's put into the ground, you're very, you're right. It's uh, similar to conduit, even stronger than that. But um, the, the longevity of this is, makes it not a Band-Aid, it's, it's a fix. Uh, my only other question would be, I think it sounds like a great idea. But the only thing I would, I would wonder about is since we have clay pipes, do they give any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, uh, warranty on things as far as if they do break the clay pipe or can't get can't get a line completely through. Do they have a backup plan for that? 
just in case. They, yeah, they do. If you if you look inside the packet, you'll notice that um, there's some alternative unit pricing or alternate okay. unit pricing, and that's for point repair. Let's say they get into a situation where the pipe collapses. Uh, we will have to go in there and replace that um, that section of pipe or that point repair. Um, so we've got that in there. The last CIPP project that we did, I believe we came out of it with about seven point repairs, which is really good. But that's the reason we get that alternate unit pricing is because we know that in some cases we're going to break that pipe and we're going to have to dig up a small portion of it and replace it. So Basically, they can tell how far they get in. If they do have a snag, they can dig down there, fix it at that point, but it keeps us from having to replace the whole thing. So we're still in good shape if that happens. I got you. Yeah, that you nailed it. You nailed it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Jerry, uh, uh, going ahead, do we need to do something tonight or can we hold that over? We can hold this over. We've, we've expedited a few and we've got them in the right order, so we can hold this over till the next meeting. All right. In that case, we will uh, hold this over to the next meeting. Uh, Mr. Poston, number 3165. Your Honor, I move that we read Bill 3165. Uh, I have a point of order. Yes, sir. I, I'm not sure if we had the... Um, given the public an opportunity to speak on the oh, last one. No, you're right. That, that is a good point of order. We are still on first reading bills. So is there anyone in the public, either on Zoom or in the meeting room, that would like to speak on Bill 3164 on the sewer rehab project? Samantha, are you in there? Is there anyone that would like to speak? There, no, they don't be speaking on anything. Okay, good enough. All right, then we will continue with 3165, Mr. Poston. Your Honor, I move that we read Bill 3165 for the first time. Your second? Second by all open force. Uh, all in favor? All right, Ms. Calloway. Amending the Municipal Code of the City of Ozark, Missouri, Section 405-690, Landscaping Policies and Procedures. All right, uh, Mr. Schmidt, or Mr. Yeah, Schmidt, do you want to take that? Explain, please. Yes, uh, as we briefly have discussed in the past, I believe at the breakfast, one of the breakfast meetings, we brought this up. Um, the current order for us to issue a temporary occupancy permit only accommodates the allowance of issuing that uh, from November 1st to March 1st. And that's uh, considering if, if the only lacking item is uh, is the landscaping. Uh, what staff is finding that we're getting continual requests to issue TCOs more year round and also for additional items, not just landscaping. Uh, but other site items that are not uh, a life safety issue for uh, a structure. So the building still uh, is inspected and conforms to all uh, the building uh, codes and, and is actually uh, approved at that point. Uh, however, the, the landscaping and the ordinance that we currently have does, does hold up us issuing a TCO uh, for that structure. So staff has revised the, the, the ordinance that you'll see in your packet uh, to accommodate us issuing a TCO year round, uh, but also catching in there with the landscaping and other site elements that are, like I said, non life safety items. Uh, staff did take this to planning zoning commission in, on May 26th and it was passed unanimously. Be happy to answer any questions. Okay. <clears throat> any questions, Mr. Smith? Okay, any, uh, any questions or comments from the audience? Okay. Might ask, might ask, but I this, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, do you want to ask, does this need to be expedited, Cameron? Cameron, I didn't know. I just know that we have a lot, a lot of stuff going on, and I didn't know if you wanted to request it. it. If we did, I mean, that would that gain us a couple of weeks. We are continually to be asked, uh, probably on a weekly basis now, for uh, for some TCO. So if, if it was uh, to consider expedite, if you guys would consider expediting this, this would be uh, much appreciated. Okay, Mr. Poston, that would be your call. All right, I don't think there's a controversy on this one, Your Honor, so I, I'm willing to do that. Your Honor, I move that we read Bill 3165 for the second time. Right here, second. Okay, Mr. Shaker, second. Uh, all in favor? 
All right, Ms. Gowling. Amending the Municipal Code of the City of Ozark, Missouri, Section 405-690, Landscaping Policies and Procedures. Okay, Mr. Poston. Your Honor, I move that we adopt Bill 3165 as Ordinance 20-042. Second. Mr. Schaefer. A move uh, seconds uh, adopting Bill 3165 as Ordinance 20042. Uh, roll call vote, please. Okay. Um, yeah, that's fine. Hi. 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 I. Okay, please, please allow me to explain what that, that uh, little side comment was that Chandler and I had that you could not hear. We have decided as a matter of policy that we are going to use a random roll call vote procedure. For uh, at least all of this last year, we have used the same order of voting and everybody knew exactly when they were going to vote and who was going to vote before them and who was going to vote after them. So we're going to start doing a random. And I was going to explain that before the second reading bills, but we've had two first reading bills that were expedited. So uh, uh, for now on, whenever there is a second reading and a roll call vote, you will notice that the, uh, the, the names will be called in a random order. So uh, don't be surprised that's done on purpose. Okay, Mr. Smith, Bill 3166. Thank you, Your Honor. I move to replace Bill 3166 on its first reading by the title and the description of the list. So here's second. Mr. Flores, a motion made by Alderman Smith, second is by Alderman Flores, and because Bill 3166 on its first reading by title only, all in favor? Okay. Ms. Callaway. An ordinance amending the preliminary plat for North Town Park, generally located south of the intersection of North Newport Drive and East Greenwich Drive, and authorizing the Director of Planning and Development to accept the dedication of the public streets and easements to the City of Ozark, Missouri, as shown on the preliminary plat, upon the applicant filing and recording a final plat that substantially conforms to the preliminary plat, and authorizing the City Clerk to sign the final plat upon compliance with the terms of this ordinance. Okay, you'll remember this is, a, of course you'll remember, this has been discussed several times, uh, but this came up again as a result of the discussion in the closed session last time, and it was, uh, it appeared as if the board wanted this brought up again, if there were certain conditions met by one by the applicant and, uh, and one by the um, uh, Ozark Special Road District. So uh, we have been dealing with those and uh, trying to see if we can get those done. And so I'll uh, turn this over to Ms. Callaway and uh, let her give us the status of those uh, two conditions or those two uh, things that were discussed in closed session. So Ms. Callaway. The Ozark Special Road District at their meeting last Tuesday voted um, or um, approved uh, in the minute in their minutes that they would allow the use of the platted right of way in the Quail Meadow subdivision by the developer for North Town Park if the city removed the conditions that had been placed on the North Town Park preliminary plat. All of the um, the commissioners for the Ozark Special Road District have signed those minutes because as you are familiar, the minutes won't actually be approved until their next meeting, but they've reviewed them and each signed them, um, indicating they agree with um, what they reflect. And they are using that in, in addition to a letter from their, their board president, Scott Blue, as confirmation of what was requested of them. The attorney for uh, the developer has provided a letter that meets the request of the alderman um, stating the, that they will um, proceed uh, they will <laughs> meet those conditions if um, conditioned obviously upon the approval of this bill. So there's a lot of things being conditioned um, that makes it a little difficult to explain, but those were emailed to you and um, 
they seem to appear to uh, meet the requirements as requested. Okay, uh, any questions of Ms. Callaway? Uh, those, those things were sent to you, but one of them is at the last minute, and I don't know that everyone has had a chance to read it, but we were, were looking for uh, that indication from Travis Elliott that his client would not file suit and that uh, also that um, uh, OSRD would allow that room to, so it looks like we have that. Mr. Galloway. Uh, I proceed my question with a comment. <clears throat> when we discussed uh, <clears throat> this issue in closed meeting, uh, I think the different aldermen uh, expressed where they would lean and what conditions they, they would like uh, to see uh, and uh, committed to vote uh, if those conditions were met. And certainly I was one of them. <clears throat> Um, but I think that was also uh, uh, in the interest of transparency, we talked about uh, releasing the city attorney from the privilege so she could describe uh, what the legal advice was uh, that precedes this vote. I think it's important for the public to know, but it was also something that we discussed in the meeting. Okay, was, was that a just a comment or was that a request for a comment from the city attorney? I'm not following you totally. Well, okay. Well, I think uh, I, I think for the limited purpose of describing uh, uh, the basis of, uh, sorry, for describing the advice that was provided in terms of the analysis of risk of loss, I move that we release uh, the city attorney from the privilege so that she can uh, provide that advice on the public uh, record in this meeting. Does that require a second? Okay, does that require, uh, I'm gonna ask you this now, does that require a second from somebody to allow you to do that? He, he, he moved procedurally. I know what he to do. It would seem that uh, it would require a second because um, he's asking that the board waive that privilege and he alone cannot make that decision. So the board would have to, I, I presume, vote on that. Yes, Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Schaefer seconds that motion. So uh, all in favor of the motion that Alderman Galloway made to release uh, the city attorney from uh, the privileged information so that she can repeat her advice publicly. All in favor of that, uh, say aye or vote. Okay, we have uh, one, two, three. I'm looking four. There's one over here. Okay, and 10, I'm <laughs> sorry. Right. I'm not used to that. Okay, well, it looks like we have five in favor. Mr. Poston, did you not vote? That's correct, sir. I am, I am not willing to waive my privilege. I don't want to okay. go down that road. Well, you're, you're privileged for the confidential information. Okay. All right. Then all opposed. You want? To... Okay. Uh, opposed. Bill Open. Opposed. All right. Miss Calloway. Get that change. What was the vote in favor? The vote was in favor, five to one. Okay. Um. And I will just preface with, as an attorney, um. I, I've not been presented with a request such as this. So if this doesn't meet the, the request of Alderman Galloway, I will happily um, try to, to word it uh, to where it does. But of course, as an attorney, I'll be careful in how I say this. Um, I expressed at the request of the Board of Aldermen um, the analysis that I had conducted related to the situation presented with the conditions placed upon the North Town Park preliminary plat. And the analysis that I had conducted um, related to concerns related to potential litigation that could be brought forward by the developer of the Northtown uh, Park preliminary plat. The analysis uh, revealed that based on um, Missouri case law that a claim could potentially be brought by the developer and the likelihood of uh, prevailing on that claim would be high uh, for the developer and it could um, <coughs> 
potentially create um, a situation where there may be uh, damages beyond the scope of just uh, forcing the city to remove the conditions. The concern um, of the city also involved potential risk that the insurer of the city would not cover those damages. Okay, is that uh, satisfactory, Mr. Galloway? It is. Okay, any, uh, any further comments or questions from the owner? All right, Mr. Smith. Oh, wait a minute. Is, is there, well, did I miss, I'm sorry, Mr. Galloway. Right. Um, there'll be no surprises in my vote uh, tonight. Uh, I really mm -hmm. wanted the members of the public uh, before we voted to, to understand what we were considering. Um, <clears throat> when you have a city attorney who is experienced in uh, land use law <clears throat> and has uh, developed experience uh, uh, in advising cities about legal issues. When you have that city attorney provide advice that a high probability existed for the developer to succeed, uh, uh, then uh, uh, you have to start thinking in terms of, uh, well, who am I making the decision for? Um, I'm a Ward 2 alderman and I'm making the decision for them and you know the concern uh, for other citizens in the area outside of the development uh, uh, for the concerns of people in Ward 2 would be, well, does this a vote, does, does this vote really just a, uh, uh, a flourish or a show? And what the end result is, is that the city loses um, and uh, <clears throat> potentially, I think it was described as unlikely, uh, uh, but possible that insurance uh, would not cover the damages. And then also as an alderman, um, you know, and then is it fair for the citizens to bear that risk? And then as an alderman, um, <clears throat> I look at the fact uh, that we're shopping insurers uh, uh, for the city and having an active claim where uh, 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 could be uh, considered uh, uh, negatively by another insurance company, even if they don't have to cover uh, the claim themselves. I don't think we heard either way what that would be there, but the concern is what we did hear from the city administrator is that we may have increased premiums or uh, not very favorable um, uh, uh, offers from other insurers, and so then at a time of uh, at a time when we're uh, called upon uh, uh, economic frugality potentially the way the economy is, uh, then we expose uh, the citizens of Ward Two um, to the potential of having taxpayer money diverted away from uh, you know worthy projects to. Uh, uh, paying uh, uh, higher premiums or having to accept uh, insurance policies with uh, higher deductibles and the risk of uh, more taxpayer funds being expended that way. Um, so uh, that's uh, why I asked uh, the city attorney to, to make the statement. And then the consensus, I think, uh, of the board was that if uh, the developer agreed that they would drop the lawsuit uh, and uh, the other <clears throat> special roads district uh, uh, also made some, some agreements. And I, I understand there's some complications about that that I'd like the city administrator to talk to talk about, but um, uh, the, if those two things happen, um, then uh, mm -hmm. uh, people that were uh, holding up uh, or were uh, opposed to changing the agreement uh, or changing the ordinance uh, rather uh, would, would change their votes. Um, so that's, that's why I, I just want the public to understand where we were coming, where we were coming from. Um, and, and then I would just ask uh, the city administrator uh, um, if he could speak to uh, the, uh, what, 
what the city is deciding to do about the safety signs for children, the other conditions that uh, don't impact traffic into the development that uh, uh, we're, we're striking away if, if we're going to continue to have those signs up. <clears throat> yeah, and you know, we've already begun um, taking great care in the concerns that were expressed by the neighboring community uh, or neighboring um, subdivision. We have uh, had our police department conduct uh, speed control uh, test and monitoring in the subdivision. We know what the average speed of the subdivision is. So now we have a base level that we can work with. Um, there's not an issue out there now. Uh, what the speed control um, studies have shown. So we don't want there to become one. And so we will continue to monitor that and make sure that our baseline does not increase from a, from a uh, uh, standpoint of any construction traffic that might be speeding through the neighborhood. We've also already installed uh, a few signs. Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, at what locations in the subdivision, but there is a map that our uh, public works department has that show you where those signs are, whether they be uh, safety signs for children or additional speed signs for people to know what the right speed is. So we're gonna to continue to do those things. We take great care in monitoring um, the manner in which any of our uh, subdivisions are built uh, with regards to tracking out onto the street of debris and yeah. dirt, um, those types of things as well. So, um, you know, we will continue to do that. And certainly if there are any concerns, we always ask for the public to give us a call and we will respond to those concerns. So we have actively been doing, uh, taking measures and we will continue to do so regardless of how the um, Board of Aldermen decide to take this uh, matter forward tonight. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? Okay, Ms. Oliver. <clears throat> okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, um, I have a new webcam, so I, I'm not sure how it was is working. It looks you like it's working that. fine. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Right now, there's only two signs in Grand Haven that uh, the city have put, has put up, and it doesn't say children playing. It just says, please slow down. One's by the commons area, which is good, but it's on the way out. It's not on the way in. The one on the way in is way down over halfway in. Um, myself, I was a little <laughs> bit disappointed with just the two signs and that it seemed to be in funny locations that I, I my, personally, I didn't think were as helpful as they could be. Well, I, I guess all I can say to that is when we did the speed study, there's not an issue in the neighborhood. Um, actually the speed, uh, the average speed was below the posted sign um that's in the neighborhood for residential streets so we don't have a current problem um but we will continue to monitor it and if there is does become a problem again that is a combination between the police department and the manner in which they have a very specific process by where they decide how signs when when and where those signs need to go and so if we do need to conduct additional speed studies we certainly can do that we have the devices now to do that. Um, so there's not an issue right now, but if there does become an issue, then again, we, we would just ask that the residents of Grand Haven let us know and we can watch those intersections or those points of concern so that we can find out um, whether or not there is need for sign. Um, but any specific questions, Mr. Parsons may have some more to add to the signage point. Mr. Parsons, do you have anything? Actually, you nailed it, uh, Mr. Childers. The, uh, the locations of those signs were chosen in coordination with the police department um, based upon where they completed their speed study, based upon line of sight, and the most effective location to be visible. Um, but again, that's, you know, if that's additional signs, like you said, were we're willing, this is not just a you know, one-time effort. We want to monitor that area. If we can do things in a different manner, I know that we also purchased a, uh, 
a solar sign that shows the speed of the uh, vehicles traveling and we're hoping to get one of those up in that in that same area uh, we actually used some grant money for that so there's several efforts that we're taking to try to avoid using the language that says ch children at play in the street but try to make them aware and keep the children off the street it, is the solar speed sign something that stays there permanently in this case yes it would stay there per permanently and will there be discussions uh with the community on where maybe a that should go so they have some input yeah we can certainly sit down with uh lieutenant boyce is usually the one that i think uh chief arnold um, delegates those responsibilities to but we could certainly sit down with either you heather or is scott deckard still the president out there yes uh-huh okay well i've got a good relationship with him as well and we've talked about many, many things. So uh, I could coordinate with him as well if you'd like me to. Okay, that sounds good. I think that would be a good idea. Thank you, Jeremy. Yep, you're very welcome. All right, before we go on to uh, comments from anybody in the audience, is there anyone else on the board that has a question or a comment? Okay, if not, Samantha, is there anyone in the uh, meeting room that, uh, uh, that would like to speak on this? Okay, or are there, yes, ma'am, are there? Yes. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor and the board, thank you uh, for allowing me to speak tonight. I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, in, you know, for transparency, I just want to be very clear. There has been no lawsuit brought against the city at this point. And quite to the contrary, I've tried to do everything within my power to avoid that. Um, I don't believe that would help anybody in this situation. So I just wanted to make that very clear for the public that the developer, myself, has not brought any lawsuit uh, against the city. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Galloway. Oh, I, I didn't know, who, who was it that spoke? Uh, that was Steve Johnson, the developer. Oh, right, Mr. Johnson. But you do, I guess uh, I'm not arguing with you, but that was your attorney that came and spoke, right? Uh, yes, sir, it was. Uh, the only reason I have an attorney is because uh, there were five attorneys in the room and I was the only guy that didn't have one. <laughs> now that's understandable. This, this attorney is not going to discourage a member of the public from hiring attorneys. But uh, I, I just uh, wanted to make sure that I understood the relationship between uh, him and you, and I, I uh, understood it was an attorney-client uh, relationship, and I do I do know that uh, uh, you haven't filed a lawsuit, and, and uh, uh, there's some commitments there, uh, depending on the vote. Uh, that's also true, um, and uh, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, your attorney did, uh, in uh, speaking to the board, speak in terms of uh, city liability. Uh, didn't, didn't I hear that? Yes, sir. It's it's my understanding that uh, we're just hoping for the city to do the right thing uh, as we follow with all of the guidance and direction and ordinances that the city. Mr. Johnson, I appreciate you investing and developing in the city, and you're also a citizen here, and I appreciate the agreement that you uh, uh, made with the city, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Any other questions from uh, Alderman? Hey, Samantha, is there anyone else to speak? Nope, that's it. Okay. Ms. Callaway. Yes, um, I'd just like to make a point of clarification related to the letter from the Ozark Special Road District. Um, the letter does indicate that um, it would anticipate that the Board of Aldermen remove all of the conditions. Um, presently, the um, the ordinance before you, which was drafted and included in the packet prior to receiving the letter, uh, which we anticipated to reflect the request that we had received from OSRD at that time, um, has the remaining five conditions. So in order to remain consistent with the OSRD's granting of the use of that access, 
um, a motion would need to be anticipated to remove those five conditions. I can't hear you. If the motion was made and it passed, that would put this back on first reading next time? No, no it could go forward tonight because the, as it stands, it would make the bill less restrictive and the conditions are really only on the city, so they do not impact anyone else. Um, the one condition that does impact the developer is something that would be required by planning and development anyway. When the final plat is submitted, it should obviously appropriate reflect the name of the of the subdivision and uh, and list that accordingly. So, really, um, the remaining conditions only impact the city, and the board has the ability to direct city staff to do things through the city administrator presently. Which I, which I think that would be what we would want to do. And as, as Mr. Galloway expressed, and I would express too, we would expect, even if we remove these other conditions that were incumbent upon the city, we would expect the city to still follow through with that, even though it wasn't part of the conditions of the plan. So, okay. Um, I'll make a motion relating to Bill 3166 that we would move. Uh, I believe that would be, and Ms. Calloway, you might need to correct me here on this, all of section one. You would um, just remove the conditions. You would amend section one um, to set, state that the Board of Aldermen are amending the preliminary plat um, by removing all conditions. And then I make a motion that we amend the preliminary plat in section one by removing all of the conditions. Second. Motion made by Alderman Smith, seconded by Alderman Wilson <laughs> to remove all of the conditions. All in favor? All opposed? Wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't, hang on a second. I didn't get a good count of all in favor. But let me, all in favor, please vote again. Okay, we have Poston, Galloway, Forrest, and Smith. Okay. I'm not used to everybody being not in the same place. Okay. There are four votes to remove. All opposed? Removing the conditions. Schaefer and uh, Alder. So the conditions are removed. So now we'll... Uh, let, me, let me ask another question now. Since we just... Uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Right. Yes, it is. Four okay. Motion passed. So would that motion just pass? Now, if I were to want to put this on second reading tonight. That would be fine. What you'll do is you're you're going to need to first um, have, um, yeah, you can expedite because we've read it in for the first time. So you can expedite it, that's fine. Would I have to read it in the first time again with the conditions removed and then do it a second time? No, the bill has been amended. And so um, I will just read the title and then the vote will be, and just so everyone's clear, it will be on the amended bill, which um, would be that you are amending the plat to remove all of the conditions. Okay, then I make a motion that we place the amended bill 3166, which removed all of the conditions on its second reading, my title and description, please. Second. Motion made by Smith, seconded by Poston to put Bill 31, amended Bill 3166 on its second reading by title only. All in favor? Okay, all opposed? All right. All right. So it passed. Put it on the second reading. Go ahead, Ms. Galloway. An ordinance amending the preliminary plat for Northtown Park generally located south of the intersection of North Newport Drive and East Greenwich Drive and authorizing the Director of Planning and Development to accept the dedication of the public streets and easements to the City of Ozark, Missouri, as shown on the preliminary plat upon the applicant filing and recording a final plat that substantially conforms to the preliminary plat and authorizing the City Clerk to sign the final plat upon compliance with the terms of this ordinance. Okay, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that we adopt amended Bill 3166 as ordinance number 20 043. Point of order. Second. Point of order. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Schaefer. Can we have discussion on second reading? Yes. Okay, that's true. Uh, I just wanted to yeah, speak we do, as we do for all of them. Yes. Go right ahead. I wanted to speak as to the removal of all conditions. I wanted to point out to the alderman that this is beyond what was presented to us in a previous meeting that we rejected by a four to two margin. At that point, we were only asked to remove some of the conditions by the special road district. And now tonight, without any really warning, we're removing all conditions. And that seems to be quite a leap from what we discussed in closed session and quite a leap from what the board had discussed at previous meetings to remove all those conditions at the request of the special road district <laughs> and a last minute letter presented to us before this meeting. I certainly understood the board's uh, inclination to remove some of those conditions as we discussed in closed session, but this is above and beyond what was presented to me in previous meetings and quite a surprise. I'm just expressing my views. Uh, obviously, I'm pretty clear where I stand on, on this. It is in my ward, but I just wanted the record to reflect that this, I think, is, is a mistake. Mr. Galloway? Yeah, I think also in the issue of transparency, it might be helpful uh, for the public and then for maybe, maybe the board members to be reminded of uh, uh, which additional conditions we're agreeing to strike. Yeah, okay. I, uh, okay. Sure. okay. The additional conditions that we were agreeing to strike was one, the city shall install children at play signage at the entrance of the Grand Haven subdivision. Two, the city shall conduct traffic monitoring in the Grand Haven subdivision periodically and upon reviews by the city engineer, the city may, if necessary, implement recognized traffic calming strategies such as signage, knockdowns. I have no idea, C-H-I-C-A-N-E-S, mid-block diverters, intersection diverters, curb bulbs, and related devices to be considered on a base case-by-case -case basis based on safety and appropriateness in this uh, proposed locations, taking into consideration the overall functionality of the roadway. And three, the city shall per periodically evaluate the condition of the road right away within Grand Haven subdivision and perform necessary inspections, repairs, and maintenance consistent with the right of way management. And four, the city shall periodically provide additional law enforcement in the Grand Haven subdivision to monitor traffic with, through the use of extra patrols, speed control devices and other resources regularly deployed by the Ozark Police Department to increase safety to the monitoring, uh, to, to monitoring public and pedestrian traffic. And then five, which I believe was what Ms. Callaway uh, addressed a moment ago, prior to final plat, the developer shall correct the following on the plat. Note one and note two shall include information for all four phases, correct the name of the homeowners association, and include a legal description of all four phases which he will have to do in that final plat, irrespective of, as my understanding, irrespective of what we do here tonight. Now, if I may, go ahead, I'm sorry. If I may, um, and, and Mr. Schaefer and, and for everyone, um, I, I, I do not disagree with anything there. This was, this was not what Mr. Addington spoke of at our meeting. It wasn't what the letter said. It was what we got though. Um, but in light of that, um, I believe the mayor, I don't want to put words around, but I believe the mayor and myself would be both willing and, and do expect to instruct the city administrator to follow through with the first four of those conditions that we're removing, irrespective of if they're legally on the plan or not. And so I, I just want to, I just want to say, I agree with you, but I think we're willing to instruct city administrator to make sure that those first four are still uh, followed through with that is true. the citizens of Green Haven. Okay, Mr. I, Galloway, and Ms. Owen, something to say. Go ahead, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Schaefer. They've got to leave that over. I'm sorry. I just, want, I just wanted my objection to be noted. I, I understand what that's saying. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Galloway? Okay, so 
Uh, the, the only question uh, that I had is because I understand the administration is committed to uh, making sure that the area is monitored. If there's feedback, that there are problems that uh, they be brought to the board board's attention. And I will also say that as far as I can tell, I, I, I acquire no liability uh, uh, for voting for a children at play sign if, uh, if we don't have one. I, I, I noticed that Mr. Parsons had some concerns about children at, at play sign. Um, uh, is, is there a concern that we, we put one up there? I know we don't wanna encourage children to play on the streets. And is there any concern about just no, uh, letting motorists know uh, that uh, children are at play. I, I used to play in the neighborhood. Sometimes that involved me yeah. being on the street. So um, Justin may be able to speak to this as well, Chief Arnold, um, but basically from a liability standpoint in any way promoting um, children playing in the street or recognizing that, there's been several studies from other communities that said it's really not in your best interest to promote that. Um, to caution is one thing, but to admit that you're condoning children at play in the right of way is a whole nother issue. So we tried to use verbiage that was less inviting and more cautionary. Okay, such as? I'm going to refer to the chief on this one because it was their final decision. Do you remember, chief? Uh, the chief is not in the room. He is not here tonight. Lieutenant. Uh, oh. Uh, lieutenant's out in the other room. <laughs> he is not in this room, so there's no one here to really reply to that. Uh, I'll okay. tell you. I, I think. Uh, go ahead. I, I guess uh, uh, this is the way uh, I, I, I think about it. Uh, I don't want to do anything that uh, um, is improper in terms of signage, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, cautionary language, uh, uh, something, it, it just, I, I know I lived on a street that wasn't well-traveled, um, and uh, I certainly know what it was like to, to, to run after a football uh, and find myself in the street catching it, if I was able to catch it. Um, and uh, uh, so I, 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 I really hope that there's uh, whatever we can do uh, 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 can be done uh, because uh, <clears throat> won't change overnight, uh, not with kids anyway. Yeah. I think, I there, think there, there are I, dozens of different types of signs and dozens of different types of language that we can put out there. I think, again, it, it, you know, we'll put all the signs up. Well, we're not going to proliferate, proliferate the neighborhood with signage because that will not keep kids chasing footballs out of the street. Um, that's going to have to be the parents that make sure that they can manage that type of thing. But we will certainly uh, use the signs so that the parents recognize that playing in the right of way is probably not a good idea. So, no, there's no way to keep the kids out of the street. We know that. But uh, again, we'll. We'll put them in the appropriate locations. We'll find the appropriate wording, and um, we'll we'll do the best we can. Uh, well, one thing, signs oh, that Grand Haven neighborhood wants. Well, um, one thing that I have can note about Grand Haven, they have no trouble expressing viewpoints as a group to the board. And if there are any problems, mm -hmm. I uh, I will certainly be listening to them. Yeah, and I hope they do. I mean, if there if there are those concerns, we we as staff want to know them, and we want to respond to those in the most appropriate manner we can. All right, Ms. Oliver, you have been very patient, so you are next. Well, three things. Uh, first of all, a response to what uh, Steve just said. It isn't the city's responsibility to keep the children out of the street. It, it is the parents but it's the city's responsibility to make sure that the cars aren't speeding to hit the children that run in the street. Sure. And the concern, the concern is that not the, so much the people that live there, as you noted, you put the speed, um, the speed test to see if there were speeders or if it was a problem. It's, it's not so much a problem right now because we all live there. We know there are children in the streets. 
the problem that we're concerned about are the builders and the the people that are coming in to build the homes that don't know about the children and are not really thinking of that. They're thinking of getting to work. And there's going to be an increase of those, that kind of traffic of people that don't have the same concerns about the people that live there or the same knowledge about those roads. You see people that come in that don't live there and they get frustrated with all the turns. They have to stop, they have to turn. They have to stop, they have to turn. What starts happening is they stop stopping. They're not stopping. They, they speed through, they make their turn. They speed through, they make another turn. They pretend it, it's just like there's no sp speed limit signs. And that's what we're afraid of. Once you get high volume of traffic going in and out of Grand Haven, people that don't live there, I don't see that not happening. It, you know, I just, um, uh, and, and it's a concern. And that's why we keep looking for different things that would will help us with that situation because we know it's coming. The other thing is I don't appreciate what happened tonight. I feel it's like an ambush and it makes me very, very unhappy. Um, I think this, the people of Grand Haven already don't trust the city. They feel like they have been lied to. They don't feel like their concerns have been been represented uh, and, and met. And I don't think this kind of action is going to help that feeling at all. And I'm really sorry to see that happen. And I would like you to explain to me why you think taking the rest of the conditions off are, are important to the uh, city road district. Why is that <laughs> something that's necessary? Boy, go ahead. I, I'm going I'm to answer that from my perspective, Heather, because because um, once again, I I'm can you not, get a little closer because I can't hear you. Understand. Okay. I will. Thank I'm going to I'm going to try to I'm going to try from my perspective. Okay, uh, explain it. <laughs> OSRD did not follow what we asked. They sent a letter that said, remove restrictions. And again, I'm not an attorney, but as a CPA, when you say remove restrictions and don't define the three that we had agreed to, that means all of them. So I looked at this from my perspective of what are those other conditions? And I didn't want to remove them originally, but when I looked at them, they were all based upon the city doing something. And since we can, we can instruct the city to do something anyway, I saw that no value in them being a part of the restrictions. And it was my decision that I would have wanted to move forward with this because to not move forward with this is going to force OSRD at another meeting to hopefully follow our instructions that time and redo their entire process, which would then put it back on our agenda somewhere else down the road. And all the while, we're keeping a developer from being able to move forward or solely, my perspective, my, my, my words, solely restrictions that are only have to do with the city not any restrictions that's really on the developer. These are all incumbent upon us to do. So when I looked at that trade-off of saying, is this worth, because originally when I found out what OSRD, I was upset. I, I'm, I'm with you, I was upset, totally upset. Um, several here can attest to that, I was, I was upset. But after I thought through it a little bit more and looked at them, they're only, they're only incumbent on the city and we can instruct the city to still do those. So from, from my perspective, the lesser of the evils is removing them versus starting the process over again and pushing it further down the road. So that, that's my perspective. I'm not saying I'm speaking for the board or the mayor or, or city administrator or anything, but that's from my perspective, why I, why I went on and made the, made the call to go and move forward with sponsoring it versus not. Because originally, and I will tell you, originally when I found this out, I said, I'm done. I'm not sponsoring it. That was my original first comments. 
It was only after I processed it and thought through it that then I started looking at what is it I'm really hung up on. And, and it's really just stuff that we as a city can commit to do anyway. Here's the problem with that. You made that decision because it made sense to you. <laughs> and because it's convenient for the city so we can get on to the business and let the developer start his project. Mm -hmm. And you may, and like you said, you say, well, the city's gonna do that anyway. But your first response when you read it is that you were angry. And that's the same way that the Grand Haven residents feel. They're gonna feel angry and they're not gonna go further with that and go, oh, well, now that I'm thinking through it logically, I can see the value because we would have, it would have taken longer to get it done and keep those restrictions on. So it's going to be okay. That they'll never get to that point where you are. They'll just say, we got screwed. And that's just so we can hurry this along and get it over with because everybody's tired of it. And the city wants the developer to go ahead and develop his project. You're never going to win back the people of Grand Haven if you do this. Allow me to make a comment on that, Heather. Well, we are hurrying yes. this along, as you say, because of the advice from our attorney. The more we uh, uh, push this down the road and not act on it, the more likely there is a, some sort of a lawsuit. So we are, we are taking the action that we felt the council, uh, the board indicated they wanted to do in closed session. It is still a vote of six people, and that's all there is to it. You all are gonna have to vote, and, and I personally talked to Scott Deckard. I got a letter from him, which you have seen. And I personally am not convinced that the entire subdivision of Grand Haven is gonna do what you said they would do. I, I'm sure that he doesn't even think that. I'm sure there will be some, but I, I don't think there's gonna be a civil war in Grand Haven. I think they understand, at least Scott Deckard understands the position that we're in because he told me that. But he told me he couldn't speak for the whole board, for the whole, uh, I'm sorry, the whole subdivision. So you saw that letter, I saw that letter. Uh, I, I just don't think that it's going to be to the extent that you said it was, but I'm not gonna argue, I don't wanna really say anymore because I don't wanna argue with you. We're gonna have to vote, about, vote on this and okay. it's gonna be what it is. Okay, I ahead. don't think that letter was written. I don't think that letter was written by Scott when he thought all the requirements were taken off. He thought only the unlocking the gate. He didn't realize that you were going to take all the the um, the requirements off. Okay, that's a good, that's a good point. You were right, <laughs> Mr. Poston. That's the, that's the problem <laughs> because it changed all of a sudden. Mr. Poston. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. This is a question for Mr. Parsons or Mr. Childers, either one. <clears throat> Are there any subdivisions in the city? Where we do not monitor traffic and make improvements if necessary. Well, I, I mean, we monitor any neighborhood that requests to be monitored. Uh, that's why we've invested dollars into the mobile uh, speed devices. Um, talking about the mo mobile speed devices, I know Jeremy mentioned earlier that we can make that mobile uh, solar speed sign permanent. My suggestion would be that you don't make that permanent, at least not until the end of the project, because if you find you're going to want to move that mobile speed sign to different parts of the neighborhood, depending on the concerns that you receive from the neighbors. So if you need to move it from one segment or one intersection to another segment or another intersection, you're going to want to keep that mobile until such time you find out where it needs to be put permanently. That was just a, a point. I, I didn't mean to get off your question. But yeah, I mean, any, anywhere where we've got concerns, we, we move around the town and we have our a police department, um, you know, monitor those situations. And um, when there's an issue, we deal with it. And when there's not, we will we deal with that appropriately too. So uh, here, the, my point is, is the, when the, once the board agreed to remove the condition of the gate, <clears throat> the rest of these conditions are for all intents and purposes for show. We do these things anyway. We're having to put in, in writing that we're going to do them for Grand Haven, but we better be doing these things all over the city anyway. I, I, am I incorrect? 
Mr. Childers? No, I mean, you know, they're, they're very standard, very common. Uh, they go without saying most of the time. So I, while I understand the, the frustration of, of some of my colleagues and I understand the frustration of, of Mr. Johnson, I understand the frustration of, of, uh, of the residents of Grand Haven. <laughs> Once we agreed to remove the condition on the gate, everything else after that is just noise. We are arguing about whether or not we should have in writing the things that the shitty should be doing anyway. And that was the reason I voted to remove these. There was one of substance, five that made us look like we were doing something that we are already doing. We removed the one of substance. We're left with these others. Let's clear these out. Let's move this project forward. If the residents of Grand Haven are upset, I understand. I'll take their phone calls and emails just as, as I'm sure everybody else on this board would. But it is time to close this out and move on. Mr. Schaefer and then Mr. Galloway. You're muted. Can't hear you. Jason, you're done. Yeah. This is directed to Ms. Calloway, uh, the city attorney. If the uh, conditions on the city are left in the ordinance, does that not give the citizens of Grand Haven the opportunity to pursue enforcement of those conditions? If they're removed from the ordinance, is it not then just at the discretion of the city for these things to be done? The fact that their condition of a plat would really place the burden on the developer. It, it really, um, it places it on the developer. So if the city doesn't do those things, then it'll be difficult for him to become final platted. Um, the, the city um, can be directed again by the alderman and the mayor to, to do those things outside the scope of the ordinance, but the ordinance would not be an actionable type of item by the um, Grand Haven sub subdivision to force the city to do something. The action would be that the plat would not be valid. So when we uh, put these in this ordinance, because it's tied to the plat, it's not the same as us passing an ordinance saying that the city had to do these things for Grand Haven. Exactly. Okay, thanks. Mr. Galloway. Yes. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I want to remind uh, everyone here that uh, we put those conditions on Grand Haven, not for Grand Haven to be treated like every other neighborhood but for Grand Haven to be treated based on the unique characteristics of how the development was going to impact it. One unique characteristic of Grand Haven is the way I understood it, as there's one way in and you can go into a loop all the way <clears throat> up through a series of turns up through to the point where you can get into the development, which is on the other side of the entrance. <clears throat> in other words, you have to drive through the neighborhood to get to the development. And that was going to put construction traffic uh, on streets that had been very, very quiet. So um, uh, the, it, it was certainly not the intention of Mr. Schaefer, I'm sure, Ms. Alder, or the members of the Board of Aldermen that voted for the conditions to vote for something that meant nothing. Um, and I don't think that was ever, ever, ever suggested. And somebody can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Now, <clears throat> uh, to address uh, Heather's concern, uh, when uh, Alderman Smith uh, <clears throat> uh, contacted me, I guess they didn't have a lot of opportunity uh, to react. Um, uh, uh, the qu question that I had for him is, well, in light of the fact that the other requirements that are being dropped that uh, really would, would be dropped, uh, meaning that still has, the plat process has to be honored, um, those that dealt, dealt with public safety or, or traffic safety, um, uh, there's nothing that uh, uh, 
uh, any organization can tell us what we do and what we don't do and how, where we prioritize safety and where we don't or why we prioritize safety. And so it would be up to executive discretion to follow through with those um, conditions. I, I think we had that conversation, right, Ted? And I, and I think you received assurances that this subdivision would be treated differently uh, from other uh, subdivisions uh, in that uh, it would get extra attention, has received extra attention and will receive extra attention because of the uniqueness of this issue. Is, was that what you gathered? Yes, sir. So do we have that commitment from the executive? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, the only thing that uh, uh, I will uh, add is it's easy for the Board of Aldermen to legislate signs. And Jeremy is a very bright person. So if he says that we can't create a sign that encourages uh, children to play in the street, and we can't create a sign that encourages children to play in the street. But if he says that there, we can do cautionary uh, language, uh, then I think we ought to know what uh, that means. And if our condition was that we put something with cautionary language designed to make sure that people uh, go on their way to work to the construction site who may be light, who may be late and on their uh, third cup of coffee that they slurp down speeding to get to the site, that at least uh, they see it. So I hope uh, that the city uh, will find something to stick in the uh, entryway there uh, that has that cautionary language. Uh, 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 like I said, it's very easy to legislate a, a sign. So I guess uh, um, to, uh, the other way to address Heather's concern uh, on the speed of this, uh, we didn't imagine that the, uh, there was a liability issue here. There was a developer who hired an attorney. The attorney spoke to us. The attorney spoke to us in terms of our liability, the city's liability. If it moved forward, we talked about taking, talked about all the issues that are involved in a lawsuit. Uh, it would be disingenuous to say uh, that the developer was not uh, moving towards a path of litigation. Uh, the city, uh, with the Board of Aldermen, in a very, very lengthy, heated uh, closed session, uh, went on and on and on. Uh, uh, we, we found a pathway to avoid that liability. Uh, with the city's commitment, uh, and especially the executive branch, to not treat this subdivision the same as others, uh, uh, but to follow through uh, with uh, uh, with the other conditions, <clears throat> that's good enough for me. And like I say, uh, this HOA <clears throat> has had a history of raising issues to us, and I'm sure we'll get feedback if that doesn't happen, but I know that it will because we publicly said it. So I urge members to, uh, as uh, Mr. Poston say, uh, well, not, not as Mr. Poston says, but I just urge members to, to uh, uh, vote uh, uh, to uh, approve this uh, ordinance. Thank you. All right. We are okay. Ms. Oliver? Yes, just a final word. Nathan, on your statement that these conditions are something that we do for every subdivision. Well, if that's so, then what's the harm in putting it in writing? if it would make this subdivision feel like they've been listened to. <clears throat> Nathan, may I answer that? I, I would like to, if you don't mind, Your Honor. No, uh, I don't know that there's any harm in it, but that's not the letter that we got from the Special Road District. So we cannot get an approval tonight to go ahead with this unless we remove all the restrictions. Otherwise, we'd have to do what Mr. Smith said and come up with a whole new bill and bring it back for a first reading and delay this at least another two weeks. And uh, it's certainly my feeling- So are the people of Grant- It's certainly my feeling that we don't want to do that to the developer. Go ahead. Ms. So Oliver, we, uh, we don't want to do that to the, to the developer, but what about the people of Grand Haven? We heard- So we're, we are- we're spending, we're, we're, we're concerned with the developer and we're concerned with the special road district because they're letting them dictate what we do. So 
I guess the people of Grand Haven, so what? Well, that's not my opinion, but I respect yours. We are going to do those things well, anyway. That's what it, but that's what it sounds like. I understand that's your opinion. I'm not arguing with your opinion. I respect your opinion. I just don't share it. Mr. Poston, did you have a comment? Are you? I, Your Honor, I don't have much more to add. I would just, I was, you know, my response would be is I, I never felt, and I have spoken to this, uh, in this to this extent that I don't feel that these conditions um, address the concerns that were raised. The gate did, obviously, but that one's been removed, and once that one fell, the rest of these, to me, um, are are things that we do. I would expect this. If I find out that my neighborhood isn't being patrolled and monitored, I'm going to have a problem with that. I think anybody would. And that was my point. Not that these things are not good or beneficial to Grand Haven, simply that I would hope that children everywhere playing in Ozark are safe, that anywhere we have a speeding problem, cops are addressing, that anywhere road maintenance needs to be done, public works is on it. That was, that was my point in, in what I said about the rest of these conditions and why I wasn't a real, uh, you know, I wasn't a big fan of these conditions to begin with. Uh, that, that's how I felt about the other conditions after the gate was removed. Well, we can stay here. I'll stay here as long as you all want to discuss this, but I would really like to say, is there anything new that needs to be added? Mr. Schmidt. You want to move to adopt? <clears throat> um, not to adopt. Okay. All right. Then I'd like to make a motion to adopt amended bill 3166 as ordinance 20-043. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Alderman Smith, seconded by Poston to adopt bill 3166 as ordinance 20043. Roll call vote, please. Alderman Galloway. Aye. Alderman Schaefer. Nay. Alderman Smith. Aye. Alderman Poston. Aye. Nay. Open Flores. Aye. All right. Motion passes four to two. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to second reading bills. Mr. Galloway, three one four five. Your Honor, I move that we place bill number 3145 on its second reading by title only. Need a second. second. Motion made by Alderman Galloway, seconded by Smith. Put bill 3145 on its second reading by title only. All in favor? Okay. Ms. Galloway. An ordinance of the city of Ozark, Missouri, authorizing the city to enter into a contract with IMS Infrastructure Management Services, LLC, for professional services. All right. Mr. Poston, you indicated you had some further comment on that. Yes, Your Honor. I have got a couple. Uh, this would be for uh, uh, for Mr. Parsons or for uh, Mr. Meyer. Is that, yeah, Mr. Meyer is either one. Um, my first question is, how long would it take how long would it take to, to do this project? How long would it take to map the streets? Mr. Myers or Mr. Parson, can you answer that? <clears throat> Sorry about that, I was on mute. Um, typically between four and seven months, start to finish. Okay. How often, how good, how long is this data good for? Uh, it's largely a function of how well it's updated. Um, if you update the work that you're doing and update the corresponding condition scores, it stays very current. Uh, it's probably a good idea to recollect every five to seven years, uh, but not really entirely necessary, depending so on the you, accuracy. When you say update the data, you mean like uh, what the expected daily traffic is on that road or something? What do you mean update the data? 
No, when uh, Jeremy's crew went in and did, for instance, a two inch overlay on a street with a PCI rating of 42, he could override that PCI rating with his current condition rating, which would be approximately an 85, hit enter, and again, all of the data recalibrates. Your average PCI, your corresponding budget expenditures. Um, so you would wanna update all of the rehab work that you accomplish. What about work that hasn't been done? So I, I, I scan a road today and it's a whatever, eight out of 10, right? Um, does the does the software make a guess about what it is two years from now? Yeah, there are deterioration curves that are actually quite specific. Uh, we'll program in a deterioration curve for every different type of roadway. For instance, your arterial concrete or your arterial um, asphalt. And we can do as many of those as the city wishes. And then those deterioration curves are programmed into the software. So it okay. will automatically age your your data. Okay, I appreciate it, sir. No worries. Um, just sorry, no more questions, Mr. Myers. All right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a no on this tonight. My objection from before is gonna stand. Um, I do not doubt Mr. Parsons, Mr. Myers, or the claims being made at all. This is simply a function of economics for me. Um, I just, I don't think, I don't know if this is a good purchase right now. And until I'm comfortable with that, I, I have to be a no on this. Could I respond to that just briefly? Yes, sir. You may. Yes. We're actually seeing an explosion in our services for that very reason. Uh, one error in selection would cost the city hundreds of thousands of dollars. Typically it's absorbed and nobody really knows the difference. Uh, but if you miss a, a last chance overlay and go into a reconstruction, uh, you're talking about a difference between $20 a square yard to $50 and up. I get that. I do. Uh, I also, you know, I, we are also sitting in a situation where we have two years of promises that we've made to the voters that we have yet to fulfill. Those roads need to be taken care of before we, you know, before your data becomes really valuable to us, we still need to take care of of, of promises we made. I think my larger problem is though, is, you know, I get, I get people that come by the house all the time and they want to sell me home automation or, or solar panels or whatever. And most of their claims are, are valid. They've got good claims. Uh, you know, you, you got all the money I'm going to save on my electric bill and so on and so forth. Uh, but if I don't got 30 K to put your solar panels up, it don't really matter if they save me money or not. And that's where I am with this project. It's not a, it's not, I'm not doubting you. I'm not doubting Mr. Parsons. It's just simply that uh, if I don't have the, if we don't have the money to purchase it, then it doesn't really help me to save me money. That's, that's kind of where I'm at on it. So, but I do appreciate your presentation and I appreciate your time, sir. Mr. Flores. I, I would like to say that, uh, you know, out of our budget that we had to put towards specifically Blacktop, uh, this is, this is just a little over 3% of that budget. Um, we were lucky enough to save a lot and, and actually come in quite a bit under our budget for what we needed to get done. I think if you look at, uh, the math on this and what all we'll save and by knowing where to put the, where to fix the roads and where not to, uh, that money that we're going to put into our roads that we've already negotiated, we're talking about 3% of what we budgeted and it's going to allow us to make really good choices on where we put hundreds of thousands of dollars of blacktop down. And so I, I think I think if we really look at it, it's uh it's almost irresponsible not to do this. Uh, like I said, it's three percent, and and getting to have all that data that's good for five to seven years and really allows us not to just the benefit from it from this budget for three percent of this year, but three percent of the next. You know, we don't have to keep reinvesting in it. It just we are able to uh, make good decisions from here forward. I, I just think it's a mistake to, you know, not spend this money. Uh, and be able to make such good choices for the next few years. So I think it's really important that we uh, we take that anytime we get a chance to make good choices and and make sure that our money is going where it should go. I, I think that we have to take those chances, and I think that we need to know that that's a wise decision, and uh, not to get hung up on on one amount because we're like I said, it's three percent of what we plan on putting into the roads. So it's not like uh, it's it's a giant investment overall. So. Just important to note that. Any other comments from the board? 
Okay, if not, Mr. Smith. Oh, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon, Mr. Galloway. I beg your pardon, Mr. Galloway. No other comments. Move to adopt. No. Are you going to make the motion to adopt? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, uh, I will. I move to adopt bill number 3145 as <clears throat> ordinance number 20-041. Four, four. Four, four, excuse me. Four. All right. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Alderman Galloway, seconded by Flores to adopt Bill 3145 as Ordinance 20044. Roll call vote, please. Alderman Shaver? Aye. Alderman Galloway? Aye. Alderman Howler? Aye. Alderman Gustin? Nay. Alderman Aye. Open Aye. Right, five, the vote is five to one, so the motion passes. Um, bill 3158, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that we place Bill 3158 on the second reading by title and description on the place. Second. Motion made by Alderman Smith, seconded by Poston, to put Bill 3158 on the second reading by title only. All in favor? Okay, Ms. Calloway. An ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into an addendum to the triple net lease with OMS LLC. All right, I think we've uh, all pretty well familiar with this, but are there any questions or, or comments before we vote? Okay, Mr. Galloway. Thank you, Your Honor. I move to Mr. Sorry. 3158 as then we adopt bill 3158 as ordinance 20-045. Motion made by Alderman Smith, seconded by Galloway to adopt bill 3158 as ordinance 20045. Roll call vote. All the questions. <clears throat> can't hear you. That's what happens when you change up the order, sir. Aye. <laughs> 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 Aye. 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 Very good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Post or Mr. Post, Mr. Childers. I just want to remind everybody that Thursday we are having a breakfast uh, meeting. Uh, it is going to be your opportunity to uh, reconvene, um, uh, not just on screen, but you can come down to the Ozark City Hall. We are going to have a breakfast meeting. We will spread out as far as we uh, can. Well, we will spread out six feet and do all the social distancing we can. Uh, those department heads that uh, do not have anything on the agenda, they will be joining us by Zoom. You certainly um, can as well. We will accommodate you if you want to do that. But I just wanted to let you know that, that the breakfast meeting will be hosted from the uh, council chambers of the Ozark City Hall. And that's at 8.30. What's for breakfast? What's for breakfast? I think last time the mayor requested you to bring wine and cheese. <laughs> but, but we've changed that to mimosas. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bring the orange. Don't tempt me. Okay. <laughs> right. that, that could happen. We, we will have something. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, next, we have the, the uh, written report of uh, planning and development. Uh, any comments or questions of Mr. Smith or Mr. Smith? Any comments you'd like to make? I'd be happy to answer any questions. I would just like to point out, we are still tracking ahead of last year on the permits. Uh, kind of anxious to see how June comes out, but we're still staying pretty busy in the department. Very good. All right, if, if there are no questions. Oh yeah, Mr. Poston. I'm sorry, not a question for uh, Mr. Smith. I thought we were on to uh, Alderman you comments. You are, we're on for your comments. Okay, perfect. And I've got a, I have a request. 
and I'm sure this is something we're working on, and I don't know if this is something staff can handle or if it's something that we need to engage Cochrane in. We have seen, uh, Steve, Cameron, we've all seen these. We've seen these heat maps before that show <laughs> revenue and cost in a community. We don't need to get as detailed as some of those as we've seen. I know we've talked about the Lafayette, Louisiana one. They did a, you know, they hire, we're not, we're not hiring consultants here, but we have got to get a grasp on what development is costing us and, uh, you know, wh where it's revenue neutral, where it's a, a cost and, and where it's actually, a, a, you know, a, you know, revenue positive. Um, We've seen Cochrane's preliminary study from what over a year ago. We mm -hmm. are beginning to fully grasp exactly what development, particularly uh, sparse single family development, cost us in terms of maintenance. We are taking on miles and miles and miles of road that this city cannot, cannot afford to maintain. And we can do it today because we're going to get them in good shape. And in 20 years ago, 20 years from now, we're going to be wondering how in the world we're going to pay. Them. Actually, we won't be wondering. You know, that's how we got in this place, because 30 years ago, they didn't think about these things. <laughs> and we're going to kick that can right on down the road again. It is time to ask those hard questions. It is time to actually understand the expenses and revenue of the city and the long term hidden uh, expense that lies in some of our infrastructure. You know, I, I kind of thought about that tonight. I, I know what Mr. Myers was trying to get at, but when he said that we had $110 million worth of road assets, I'm like, no, we don't. We have $110 million worth of road today and tomorrow they're worth less. Road, our roads are a liability. Sewer and water have a uh, user fees that can be uh, raised or lowered to, to recognize the reality of the situation. Anything that's paid for by taxes doesn't have that. We need a model that will let us understand what a road is going to cost us when it comes time to repave it. We need to understand whether or not a development, a subdivision, a strip mall, whatever it is, is going to generate enough revenue to pay for itself. And I'm not saying that all of the, that if the answer is to no to any of these, I'm, I'm not arguing that it's an automatic, nope, not doing that. But we need to know that. We need to know that if we take on a development, we're taking on a multi-million dollar liability. And is the city willing to pick up the tab on that liability when a neighborhood or a development or some other uh, commercial development even isn't paying for itself? We need to understand that. And so I understand that's a pretty big tasking. Um, I don't know how far Cochrane is down this path already. Um, I would like to understand this. I'd like to make some estimates. And, and we do, again, we know these are going to be best guesses. I'd like to make some estimates about property taxes, you know, over a neighborhood. We used that Apple Creek one years ago when we were trying to figure out, you know, did Apple Creek pay enough to, to pave its own roads? You know, uh, I want to see that. I, I would like to see those models. I think we need to turn, find a way to factor those models uh, back into our annexation and zoning decisions. Um, we, can't, we can't continue, folks. We can't continue. You can't continue to agree to take a road that you can't fix. And it's what we do over and over. And at the same time that we got citizens telling us, I would like more trails and more parks, those same citizens are saying, by the way, I'm not paying for it. So we have got to find a way. That if we're going to, you know, uh, I think, Mr. Mayor, you said it the other day, we're going to move forward, but we're going to move forward slowly. And I agree with that. I think that's a pretty good assessment. I think we also need to move forward judiciously. We do not have enough information about the actual cost of development to understand its pros and cons for the city. And I would like to get a better grasp of that. Let, let me chime in and say that I agree with you. One of the things that, that concerns me is that and it's, it's just exactly what you're talking about. But some of those regulations, uh, we need to have regulations in place to monitor our growth or to control our growth if we feel we can't afford the growth. Right now, like uh, the Staker subdivision, 
uh, we love to use the, the, the slogan or the, the saying, they checked all the boxes, but we can't very well say no to somebody that checks all the boxes. So we need to change the boxes. And, and that's what I think we need to do if we want to have more control over growth. If we think that we're seeing a big, uh, you know, you're gonna see a, a big influx of growth, then, then we need to do some things to possibly to slow that down. I, I, a moratorium is a four letter word, but, but the rules are in place to go ahead and grow. So we're gonna have to change the rules if we're not gonna do that. That's that's my thought. Your Honor, and just may if I could continue real quick, I think that was actually, I'm glad you brought that up. That was, that was gonna be the second thing. I'm not asking for action on this. I'm just asking for staff to kind of mull it around. Um, moratorium. Um, you certainly don't want to put a moratorium on everything. You may not want to put it on anything. But I think that there is a chance that we would, it could be in our best interest to put a moratorium on projects that are going to leave this city with a, uh, an expense that we do not currently have an offsetting revenue stream for. And I think, you know, thinking of a moratorium, perhaps in those terms, um, you know, not to say no new single family, but no new single family that doesn't generate enough revenue to pay its own, pave its own roads. Um, you know, that type of thing, maybe that is somewhere we want to go eventually. And I think that's something you should be at least thinking on. Well, any, any process we use to evaluate that is gonna to have to be very objective and not subjective, but we're opening up ourselves to it. A bigger can of worms than we almost got into tonight. So, but I'm not saying that we don't need to look into that. I, I don't know the answer either. I've, I've been watching this growth for 37 years and uh, it, it goes in cycles and we have cycles of good income and, and bad income. And I mean, it, it changes. Uh, 10 years ago, we couldn't afford to buy paper towels. I, mean, I don't know if they'll get that bad or not, but but I agree that we need to, to look into that. And I, Steve and I have talked about that. Uh, so do you want to make a comment on that? I just want to say that, yes, I agree. Those things need to be talked about. But I really just want to commend the board. I mean, I think this is a great board. I think you guys are having these conversations. We, we've got a, a wonderful um, uh, initiative that's still out there. It's right behind me. It's called Love Your City. I think we all love the city. It's why we do what we do. It's why you guys serve on the board and give your time. Um, so I think you are having the right conversations. I think due to our unsuccessful ballot initiative um, uh, with regards to the use tax, I think that conversation now has to change. But we knew that it could. Um, so I think the next three months are pivotal. Um, I think that uh, our breakfast meetings have served an enormously beneficial purpose. It gives us opportunities to have working sessions. Um, I received a, a, an email I was very excited about from uh, Alderman Galloway, who said, you know what, and I don't even remember what meeting it was after, but it was a presentation, it might have been the breakfast meeting, and he said, you know, that was really awesome. Now I'm ready for a retreat. And I think that he's right. I, I think that we work in June and July and we work our way to August and we answer these questions that you're talking about. We develop these models about return on investment, what's good, what's not. Um, I think you do have to, uh, I, I think moratorium is maybe something that you may not have to utilize. I think that there are ways to have the discussions about annexation, work with our, our planning director and our city attorney to say, where is the right thing? What is the right time? How do we properly do this? Do we need to go back and modify? Uh, we had this conversation the other day, our, our comprehensive land use plan to, to really truly reflect the goals and objectives that we are trying to achieve. And Alderman Poston, you pointed it out. You said, you know, we may have more in there that that is right than wrong. So please go read the comprehensive plan. <laughs> you know, I want everybody to look at that. So I think you guys are on the right track. I think that the next three months uh, will be very productive. Uh, I hope they will. I know that the staff is very excited um, to bring you the information that will help you make qualified decisions about what the next 10 years really looks like. So, um, you know, we, we, got a, we got a bruise. Uh, we didn't make it. Um, it was the perfect storm, unfortunately. Uh, you know, uh, 
when, when we put the use tax on the ballot, it was the best economy ever. Um, there were, uh, there was the lowest unemployment ever. It was also scheduled for April. There was no organized opposition. Uh, there were no protests in the street. And there was no COVID. So in three short months, all that happened. And so who would have known, you know? Um, so that being said, I, again, I think that this sign back here says it all. I think we need to step back. I think we need to have these breakfast meetings. I think we need to look at a retreat in August. And I think we need to get, we get it, we'll get it figured out. I, I truly believe that. And I think those, we want to answer those questions all of them posted. I think you, you nailed it. We need to answer them. I'm sorry, I no, want to say no. that. that. That's what this time in the, yes, Heather, go ahead. Uh, at the breakfast meeting, are you are you requiring mask? Mask. Oh no. Do you, not requiring mask. Yeah. Do you no, wear them? Are, is anybody wearing? Well, you are welcome to wear one. And we can. do have some. If you don't have one, we are happy to provide that for you. Okay. Thank Just you. Wanted you to know. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, any other comments by uh, anybody on the board? Okay, I think we're ready to call it quits. Uh, I sincerely hope that this is the last Zoom meeting. I really appreciate your all's, uh, uh, your, your patience. It, it is difficult from where you're sitting and from where I'm sitting to, to have this kind of a meeting where you, you can't really get the full feeling of being in person and, and looking at each other and it's just not as easy and it's not as meaningful. It, it, uh, it's not as emotional uh, and that's, that's, that's a bad thing. I mean, we need to understand and feel what everybody's thinking. And, and so the, this is the best, best solution we had, but uh, it's not the best solution. So thank you all and uh, uh, hopefully, prayerfully, we will go ahead in person from now on. Oh. So, <laughs> You know, we will see how that goes. So uh, we, one thing I will tell you, and you, you've read the, uh, the notice, we, we left the executive order in place for the end of December. So that gives staff and myself the opportunity to impose restrictions again if we need to. We certainly hope we don't. I did have a couple of calls from people that saw that because they thought that we put those social distancing things in as a restriction. If you look closely at that, they're strongly recommended. They're not restrictions. So social distancing is what we are strongly recommending and hopefully we'll avoid uh, another outbreak. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you for being patient with me. Anything else? Go ahead, motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion made by Smith. Who's gonna second? second? Mr. Flores is second. Uh, all in favor, uh, say aye and leave. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I don't want.